Victorian London never slept, and, much like today, somewhere, someone is drinking, dancing, or gambling, and many more are working until dawn. This has always been the history of this great metropolis. The story in the 19th century was no different, but it also had a nefarious side. When shops had long since closed and the roar of the streets had died away, many remained awake. The working poor, labouring by candlelight, perhaps stitching, merely to survive. Some wretched souls wandered the streets, or frequented dubious eating and drinking establishments that operated through the small hours. For, by night, the streets were, save for a lonely policeman or drunkard, the haunt of thugs, prostitutes and beggars. Today, we will accompany a Victorian journalist into London's underworld by night as he seeks to shed light on the suffering of the hard-working poor. Find out how, as darkness drew a veil over the city, the streets became a dangerous netherworld where the wicked debauched and preyed on the innocent. All the while, hidden in cellars and garrets, the poor, be they old, young, sick or infirm, toiled ceaselessly to stave off hunger, the rent collector, and a life on the same treacherous streets. Before we move on, if you're interested in history like this, and you want to find out more about what life was really like for people in the past, please consider subscribing for more content. If you'd like to support what we make for you, check out the description for links to ways you can help us to continue bringing the past alive. London's great underworld to many may be an undiscovered country. To me, it is almost as familiar as my own fireside. Twenty-five years of my life has been spent amongst its inhabitants, and their lives and circumstances have been my deep concern. Sad and weary many of those years have been, but always full of absorbing interest, Yet I have found much that gave me pleasure, and it is no exaggeration when I say that some of my happiest hours have been spent among the poorest inhabitants of the great underworld. But, whether happy or sorrowful, I was always interested, for the strange contrasts and the ever-varying characteristics and lives of the inhabitants always compelled attention, interest, and thought. There is much in this underworld to terrorize, but there is also much to inspire. Horrible speech and strange tongues are heard in it. Accents of sorrow and bursts of angry sound prevail in it. Drunkenness, debauchery, crime and ignorance are never absent, and in it men and women grown old in sin and crime spend their last evil days. The whining voice of the professional mendicant is ever heard in its streets for its poverty-stricken inhabitants readily respond to every appeal for help. So, it is full of contrasts, for everlasting toil goes on, and the hum of industry ever resounds. Magnificent self-reliance is continually exhibited, and self-denial of no mean order is the rule. The prattle of little children and the voice of maternal love make sweet music in its doleful streets and glorious devotion dignifies and illumines the poorest homes. But of the purlieus of this netherworld, strange beings issue when the shades of evening fall. Men whose hands are against every man come forth to deeds of crime, like beasts to seek their prey. Women, fearsome creatures, whose steps lead down to hell to seek their male companions. Let us stand and watch. Here comes a poor smitten, wretched old man. See how he hugs the rags of his respectability. His old frayed frock coat is buttoned tightly around him, and his outstretched hands tell he is eager for the least boon that pity can bestow. He has found that the way of the transgressor is hard. He has kissed the bloom of pleasure's painted lips. He has found them pale as death. But others follow and hurry by, and a motley lot they are. Figure and speech, complexion and dress all combine to create dismay. But they all have one common characteristic. They want money, 
and are not particular about the means of getting it. Now issue forth an innumerable band who, during the day, have been sleeping off the effects of last night's debauch. With eager steps, droughty throats and keen desire, they seek the wine cup yet again. Now come fellows, young and middle-aged, who dare not be seen by day, for whom the police hold warrants, for they have absconded from wives and children, leaving them chargeable to the parish. Here are men who have robbed their employers. Here, young people of both sexes who have drained Circe's cup and broken their parents' hearts. Surely it is a strange and heterogeneous procession that issues evening by evening from the caves and dens of London's underworld. But notice, there is also a returning procession, for as the sun sinks to rest, sad-faced men seek some cover where they may lie down and rest their weary bones, where perchance they may sleep and regain some degree of passive courage that will enable them, at the first streak of morning light, to rise and begin again a disheartening round of tramp, tramp, searching for work that is everlastingly denied them. Hungry and footsore, their souls fainting within them, they seek the homes where wives and children await their return with patient but hopeless resignation. Take notice, if you will, of the places they enter, for surely the beautiful word home is desecrated if applied to most of their habitations. Horrid places within and without, back to back and face to face they stand. At their doorway, death stands ready to strike. In the murky light of little rooms, filled with thick air, child life has struggled into existence. Up and down their narrow stairs, patient endurance and passive hopelessness ever pass and repass. Small wonder that the filthy waters of a neighbouring canal woo and receive so many broken hearts and emaciated bodies. But the procession now changes its sex, for weary widowed women are returning to children who for many hours have been lacking a mother's care. For mothers in the underworld must work if children must eat. So... The weary widows have been at the wash-tubs all day long, and are coming home with two shillings hardly earned. They call in at the dirty general shop, where margarine, cheese, bread, tinned meat, and firewood are closely commingled in the dank air. A loaf, a pennyworth of margarine, a pennyworth of tea, a bundle of firewood, half a pound of sugar. A pint of lamp oil exhaust their list of purchases, for the major part of their earnings is required for the rent. So they climb their stairs, they feed the children, put them on washed to bed, do some necessary household work, and then settle down themselves in some shape, without change of attire, that they may rest and be ready for the duties of the ensuing day. Perhaps sweet oblivion will come even to them. Blessings on the man who invented sleep, cried Sancho Panza. And there is a world of truth in his ecstatic exclamation. It wraps round him like a garment. Aye, that it does. For what would the poor weary women and men of London's underworld do without it? What would the sick and suffering be without it? in tiny rooms where darkness is made visible by pennyworths of oil burned in cheap and nasty lamps. There is no lack of pain and suffering, and no lack of patient endurance and passive heroism. As night closes in and semi-darkness reigns around, when the streets are comparatively silent, when children's voices are no longer heard, come with me and explore. It is one o'clock a.m., and we go down six steps into what is facetiously termed a breakfast parlour. Here we find a man and woman about sixty years of age. The woman is seated at a small table, on which stands a small, evil-smelling lamp, and the man is seated at another small table, but gets no assistance from the lamp. He works in comparative gloom, for he is almost blind, 
He works by touch. For fifty years they have been makers of artificial flowers. Both are clever artists, and the shops of the West End have fairly blazed with the glory of their roses. Winsome lassies and serene ladies have made themselves gay with their flowers. There they sit, as they have sat together for thirty years. Neither can read or write, but what can be done in flowers they can do. Long hours and dark rooms have made the man almost blind. He suffers also from heart disease and dropsy. He cannot do much, but he can sit and sit while his wife works and works. For in the underworld married women must work if dying husbands are to be cared for. So, for fifteen hours daily and nightly, they sit at their roses. Then they lie down on the bed we see in the corner. But sleep does not come, for asthma troubles him, and he must be attended and nursed. Shall we pay another visit to that underworld room? Come, then. Two months have passed away. The evil-smelling lamp is still burning. The woman still sits at the table, but no rose-leaves are before her. She is making black tulips. On the bed lies a still form with limbs decently smooth and composed. The poor blind eyes are closed forever. He is awaiting the day of burial. And day after day, the partner of his life and death is sitting and working. For in this underworld bereaved wives must work if husbands are to be decently buried. The black tulips she will wear as mourning for him. She will accompany his poor body to the cemetery, and then return to live alone, and to finish her work alone. But let us continue our midnight explorations, heedless of the men and women now returning from their nightly prowl who jostle us as they pass. We... Enter another room where the air is thick and makes us sick and faint. We stand at the entrance and look around. We see again the evil-smelling lamp, and again a woman at work at a small table. And she too is a widow. She is making cardboard boxes, and pretty things they are. Two beds are in the room, and one contains three and the other two children. On the beds lie scores of dainty boxes. The outside parts lie on one bed, and the insides on the other. They are drying while the children sleep. By and by they will be put together, tied in dozens, and next morning taken to the factory. But of their future history we dare not inquire. The widow speaks to us, but her hands never rest. We notice the celerity of her movements. The dreadful automatic certainty of her touch is almost maddening. We wait and watch, but all in vain for some false movement that shall tell us she is a human and not a machine. But no, over her shoulder to the bed on the left side, or over her shoulder to the bed on the right side, the boxes fly, and minute by minute and hour by hour the boxes will continue to grow till her task is completed. Then she will put them together, tie them in dozens, and lay herself down on that bed that contains the two children. Need we continue? I think not. But it may give wings to imagination when I say that in London's underworld there are at least fifty thousand women whose earnings do not exceed three halfpence per hour, and who live under conditions similar to those described. Working. Working day and night, when they have work to do, and practically starving when work is scarce.